All right, thank you all so much. Wow, we did it. We got a bunch of people in a room. <laughs> and for the IPC folks, we got a bunch of people in a room across the ocean, that's fun. Um, so, I am Kevin Becerra. I use he and his pronouns. I work at Arts Emerson in Boston, but in this context, I am a facilitator for the IPC. This, you're wondering, you're talking into a microphone, but you don't sound amplified. I'm not. Um, we are recording this uh, for archival purposes. Um, uh, we're not live streaming, but we are going to use the footage later. So um, just a quick note that when we do speak, we'll be passing a microphone so that uh, we can have quality audio for that recording. And then also uh, these in the center will be picking up some ambient noise. Um, so I have a little bit of housekeeping, but I think because we don't have everyone forever, uh, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Colleen. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. First of all, we want to thank you all for taking your time out from seeing all those amazing shows. And as soon as this is over with, we want you to go back in and see those amazing shows. We are so thrilled, the International Presenting Commons and HowlAround, to be co-hosting this discussion on strengthening the connections during turbulent times with our co-host, the International, the Edinburgh International Festival. And we are so thrilled to have with us, who will speak first, and then she has many things to go on to do, Nicola Benedetti, who is the festival director. This is her first festival. She's a series of firsts. Her first festival. She is the first Scots to run the festival. She is the first woman to run the festival and the first artist. A violinist since she was four years old. At eight years old, she commanded the British Youth Orchestra. She's had an incredible career. She continues to perform and tour around the world. So we are so honored, Nikki, to have you here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, it does feel strange speaking into a microphone <laughs> that's not amplified. What's happened? Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. It's so wonderful to see you and um, so lovely to, to see all of you um, and for us to be co-hosting the event. Um, I love everything about the, the principles but also the questions asked at this point um, around the turbulence of these times and how to strengthen ties and connection, uh, especially when things are fragmented and a lot of things are more dispersed and disparate. Um, so I guess it's useful just to explain a little bit about the thinking behind this year's festival. Um, some of it you can't miss with our massive big question, where do we go from here, that we're asking of everyone. But um, a lot of debate for us all um, internally over the last year or so has been looking at the very difficult push and pull balance between being a place where excellence in artistic presentation is not something that we will ever compromise on. And with that comes um, a huge amount of natural, sometimes restrictions or boundaries, or um, it's kind of a, a tension that's constantly pulling you in a certain direction. It requires so much skill set, so much professionalism, people that have spent their lives dedicated to knowing how to do a particular thing. All of that costs something, and I don't just mean infrastructure and money, it costs everybody, their, their internal being it costs something to dedicate that much to such a high level of attainment. But equally, we're a festival that um, was born with extremely high ideals that speak to and are about and for people. Um, when you're speaking about um, the, the human spirit, you're speaking about healing, you're speaking about reconciliation, you're speaking about breaking down boundaries, you're speaking about things that are non-hierarchical or breaking away from um, an us and them mentality. And of course, immediately post Second World War, that was as uh, live and tangible as ever. You are you must be speaking to everyone. You must be trying to speak to everyone. So those two things, they, they, they have a natural tension. So, so much of our internal dialogue has been around how actually do we occupy a space that, is, that feels completely open-armed, completely welcoming, completely about community, and that anyone is welcome in our spaces, but that we're not then trying to say, 
okay, we're going to the things where the most people are occupying spaces within music, within presentation. Um, and because that is not going to be a Dvorak symphony. It's not like the entire world is sitting there listening to Dvorak symphony. Um, or, you know, so, so that's been a sort of a natural place of tension for us. So what we decided to do um, is this year, especially after the, the, we had a 75 year celebration last year and it was Fergus Linehan's last year also. Um, and it was kind of the first outing post um, pandemic that felt somewhat real, felt very real actually last year. Uh, this year, we decided to open that dialogue and question to absolutely everyone. So in every way we could possibly manifest, we've actually opened up the dialogue to the audience. Um, now, it's not obviously possible to manifest that in every space for every performance of which there are 300 over three weeks. But there are lots of ways that we have started to try to do that. So part of it is how we communicate with the people that are coming to things. So through smaller, um, like not gifts, but smaller gestures, like sending a message that also has a podcast attached to it that has a little bit of information that feels a bit more sort of personally put together uh, to um, just careful consideration as to how people are greeted and welcomed, an increase in everything that encompasses our accessibility to the festival, breaking down any barriers that may be there that um, without the proper research and training we're not actually aware of. So we've uh, hired somebody full time to look at that and has made an immediate impact. Um, trialing different formats for how we present things so um, over the the and that that's been applied this year mostly to music but I think we'll sort of um, open that out more to all of the art forms from from next year um, so, uh, taking an example of the the symphony orchestra um, obviously being a, a, a pretty staid format of the whole orchestra on stage and and rows of stall seats so the usher halls felt like a very different place for the last couple of days we we had I don't know if any of you were there last night with all the bean bags around the orchestra you yeah, um, so we, the audience and orchestra were as one, basically. Um, and we also had big community events in the gardens over the weekend. Um, on the Saturday, we actually had 360 non-professional musicians of all ages from all over the country come together to create a piece of music of which they had all essentially composed and contributed to. So the idea that everyone is creative, can participate and has something to say, they feel like the festival is far more theirs than other so for m my dream would be that you have larger numbers than that participating in a collective moment and then they go and see the opening concert in the usher hall which is a two hour long oratorio written by tan dunn um you know I, it, like that for me that that encompasses that real um, natural but beautiful tension in what this festival, what is our kind of most honest home and honest place. Um, and I just want to finish by saying that uh, in trying to open up the conversation and having trust in people, it's, it's always, always scary because the minute you permit everyone to be able to say more and to give more, there's something you're not gonna like for sure. And, uh, and, and to, to both encourage a deeper human respect for one another, to, to be constantly sort of reiterating in, in, in the soft power ways that the arts can, that increased tolerance for an opinion that's so far away from yours, actually the third um, invitation that we have of the three in this festival is called a perspective that's not one's own. And how much can we tolerate and enter into that perspective? But how, how can you create spaces that are increasingly tolerant but also spaces that are actually genuinely inviting and open. Ones that, that you're not just play acting, saying we want to hear from you and I want to feel where you're coming from, but you actually mean it. And some of that may be being exposed to, yeah, things that you, you don't like or find offensive. And, and so, so we're, but, but to trust in people and for the festival to know that we're not a machine and that yes, we're professional 
it unbelievably professional. I just the amount the amount and, and I, I can say that because I'm this new. I'm like so I'm saying it about the team. I'm not saying it about myself. <laughs> um, I like it's just uh, they're amazing what I've kind of seen and interacted with, and it's just it's it's really mind-boggling. Um, but we're professional, but that does not mean that we're impersonal. It doesn't mean that we're not a collection of people that are just like other people, and. Um, I hope that we've started that sense of almost a, a shared, um, like, cause it's like a shared communion um, between audience and artist alike, and and all of the the staff that work at the festival. That we're we're going, we're entering into something together with that sense of trust and exploration. Um, so I I hope that's helpful in that's some way perfect. to share. But it's just such a perfect. such a pleasure to have the chance to speak with you all. And I will stay and listen just for a wee bit, and then I might just like sneak off. Back, right? Yeah. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki. That was fantastic. And it's wonderful that we're in this space. And tonight we're all going to see Trojan women. So we're we're very thrilled. And uh, congratulations on your first year. It's my pleasure now to introduce our co-host of this event, Roy Luxford. Roy has been with the International Festival since 2007. He is the creative director. Now during that time, Roy's responsibility grows and grows and grows. And in addition to having expertly curated the festival in terms of theater and dance and other things, he also looks after the production of the festival. Previously, he was the executive director of Cheek by Jowl, the Michael Clark Company, he had, at Sadler's Wells, the Peacock Theater, general manager of DB8, physical theater, line producer for the first UK tour of Stomp, and he has been a dear friend and a colleague for many years. Roy Luxford. Thanks so much, Colleen, and welcome, everyone. It's, it's great to see you here. <laughs> It's great to see you all. I quite often just see you in a foyer, thrusting a ticket in your hand and going, go, get in, before it starts. <laughs> so it's actually quite nice to find a moment within a festival context to take a moment to, uh, and to actually have this conversation. So thank you, Colleen, thank you, Kevin, and uh, all your colleagues uh, for initiating this idea. And um, thank you for the introduction, but there is a huge team that actually uh, delivers the International Festival. And my key colleague is Emma Hay here, who's the production <laughs> program manager. So um, some of you will know lots about us, and some of you won't know quite so much. So just to sketch in uh, the essential details for you, the Edinburgh International Festival, founded 1947. It was a moment post the Second World War, very much about international collaboration, and this beautiful phrase, a platform for the flowering of the human spirit through arts and culture. It seems to remain as ever present as the day uh, it was first coined. Of course, it's not just about the International Festival. The Edinburgh Fringe Festival was founded in the same year. Shona, welcome, nice to see you today. Um, we also have a film festival, a book festival. Uh, in recent years, an art festival has joined. So really, the ecology in Edinburgh in August is about a series of cultural and artistic enterprises that make this the festival city. It's not just about August. Uh, we have colleagues, uh, Mike, I can see you from uh, the Lyceum and Linda from the Traverse, uh, key producing theatres in the city who also host uh, work during August. So the special quality about this time of year is this real meeting point between different art forms, between different uh, makers, curators, companies, and I think what underpins everything for all of us is a spirit and a, an enterprise of internationalism, and that is our bedrock. Um, in terms of this year's programme for the International Festival, I will just take an opportunity to say we have over 300 events. We have 2,500 artists from some uh, 50 countries. Um, our artists uh, number about 800 from Scotland. And as Nikki referenced, we had nigh on 450 uh, amateur and youth music makers on the stages in Princess Street Gardens over the weekend for our opening celebration. And throughout the year, the International Festival has 
uh, in this last year around 4,000 engagements across the communities in Edinburgh and we were through every uh, council ward in the city. So it's not just about our August moment, it is very much about being part of the fabric of uh, uh, Edinburgh and playing our part in the civic society. Um, as this year's provocation is, is where do we go from here? And I think uh, the basis of the conversation this afternoon, just to put in some statistics um, around the festivals and speaking plurally, uh, not just about ourselves, um, I think it's fair to say for all of us, we are fundamentally about artists and audiences and cultural experiences. That being said, uh, a recently published impact study on the benefit of the Edinburgh festivals the economic impact is £367 million to the city, or £33 for every pound of subsidy. It creates 7,000 jobs in Edinburgh and approximately 8,000 jobs across the country. The annual audience of the Edinburgh festivals, in terms of tickets, is the equivalent to the Men's Football World Cup. We're second only to the Olympics in terms of a ticketed uh, audience. And both of those two events I've just mentioned take place on a four-year cycle, and they've never been in a city which has a resident population of half a million people. <laughs> I'm not going to finish that sentence. I think that's exactly it. Um, I'm just going to put out there a few challenges that may come up in the conversation and being deliberately brief so that uh, everybody can join in. Um, I think one of the major challenges in the UK, in the UK funding system, our model of subsidy is deteriorating. We're still all trying to work within this model. The key element is no longer a crucial and vital part of it, the actual grant in aid from our cultural organisations. There's a big question mark, uh, question mark over leadership, uh, both in terms of government level and local government. Uh, the cultural infrastructure of this city, the festival city, uh, is well behind what that statement might suggest. There's COVID. We all will probably have similar challenges coming out of COVID. Uh, coming out of COVID, the real impact of Brexit uh, is upon us, and particularly for artists who are touring from the UK into uh, mainland Europe. And I think uh, we were chatting at lunchtime and a skill shortage is definitely present amongst us all. And amongst that, I would just say uh, a success story. The film festival that I mentioned, um, the longest continually running film festival in Edinburgh, uh, the company went bankrupt uh, just before Christmas. The International Festival was one of the partners that stepped in to offer us uh, an opportunity for the festival to continue. So with some great support from uh, funders and other stakeholders, the International Festival has this year added to its uh, August programme a film festival, which will take place from the 18th to the 22nd. So I think amongst all of these challenges uh, we face, there are solutions and there are opportunities to do things slightly differently. So, Keeping it very brief, welcome again, welcome to Edinburgh. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. I wonder, um, Colleen. Thank you, Roy. We really appreciate your being here, and I know Nikki had to sneak out, but we very much appreciate the International Festival co hosting us. Colleen, before you give a little IPC uh, uh, context, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah. You know, I was going to do that. All of a sudden, I went, I introduced Nikki, and people thought, who is that woman? Um, <laughs> I'm Colleen Jennings Rogensack, Vice President of Cultural Affairs at Arizona State University and Executive Director of ASU Gamage. And what I'd like to do is ask all of our International Presenting Commons colleagues just to raise their hands so people have an idea who we are in the delegation. So please take time afterwards to meet and greet and talk to our fellow colleagues. The IPC began at a time during the pandemic when we said, wait a second. What are we doing to continue to support the exchange of international artists? So it was a gathering of presenters, independent producers, directors to talk about what are we doing, what issues are we facing, what has been our history in terms of American presenting and internationalism. We did that through a series of streamed productions through HowlRound TV, and it was so wonderful that the team from HowlRound, could you just raise your hand, everyone from HowlRound? Thank you, both of them. <laughs> Thank you, Abigail. Helped us to convene 
and have these discussions and then have them streamed out. We were able to do our first live stream out went under the radar in New York City and then we met at the Hamburg, the Summerfest in Hamburg, Germany. Since then we've also had gatherings in Chile and in the Netherlands and this um, then marks our third international. We are indeed looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say how we can learn together, listen together, and move forward together. And it's more than just talk. We want to be able to have some doable actions coming out of this. I'm going to keep it that short, Kevin. I Turn love it. it. Back to you. I love it so much. Uh, our colleague, Mary Lou Aleski, says, um, how do we move from a think tank to a do tank? And so that's always kind of the question the IPC is asking itself. It's great. We love hearing and learning and also thinking towards, OK, so how is tomorrow a little different? from today after we've heard and learned. Um, okay, so some quick uh, things for the room. Uh, we go two hours, we go until four o'clock. Afterwards, we'll convene in the bar for a glass of wine. Um, so because it's a very brief time, we won't be taking any breaks. So if you need to take a break, stretch your legs, run to the restroom, please, by all means, we're in a beautiful circle. Take care of yourself. Uh, and uh, we'll be passing the mics around as people have things to share. Just ask that when you do get the mic, introduce yourself. Um, we won't be taking the time today, unfortunately, to go around and hear everyone's name and context, but just a quick introduction when you have something to share would be great. I would also add that um, if you are sharing context of, of the work that you do when you are answering a question or sharing a reflection, um, perhaps not the whole bio or mission statement of the organization, <laughs> just like a quick, Here's what we do. Um, I will also add that Colleen and I, in the spirit of moving through the conversation, may uh, redirect uh, or uh, lovingly and respectfully um, interrupt uh, <laughs> at some point. Um, I think it, it's important to acknowledge that our, uh, our work is very nuanced and different, of course. The challenges we face are nuanced and different. And also, we are in uh, many similar, we're in a similar storm, but in different boats, right? And so I think there are times when we're going to really be with you. Uh, and so we may say, we hear you, we understand, and we're going to continue forward. So just putting that out there. Um, and just making sure I'm not missing anything. Oh, yeah. So give you a kind of sense of scaffolding. We're going to start with some questions that are pretty local and specific to our individual experiences. We're going to be listening for some larger themes, and then we're going to see where the kind of big um, connections are. And then um, to put um, my wonderful colleague from Emerson on the spot, David House will, will end with some, uh, some reflection on what he's heard in the conversation. I hope he got that text message where I told him that he would be doing that. <laughs> Maybe he didn't. Um, we're all uh, living here in the moment. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Roy to talk about a little bit of kind of given circumstances for our conversation. Okay, so we don't want to get too bogged down in the things that we all know that are ever-present. We really want to have a conversation about possible solutions, enterprising ideas, what is this way forward? Indeed, where do we go from here? So um, we, we could easily get uh, into a very deep conversation about budgets and the lack of finance. But I think the conversation really is about how do we find ways of financing our projects? How do we uh, keep the doors open, artists nourished and work created? If anybody wants to shout out any other things that we shouldn't get too um, involved with, we're, we're good? OK. I'm actually going to interrupt just quickly. So um, you gave a great quick look at the funding structure in uh, the UK. Great. And right. I wonder, to, to speak um, other funding structure uh, given circumstances, if we could just hear quickly from my colleague Mara Isaacs here about um, a kind of snapshot of the US funding structure and some of those challenges for folks in the room who may not be familiar. Uh, I'll try to do this quickly. So uh, I'm Mara Isaacs. I'm an independent producer um, working both in kind of big Broadway commercial sector, also independent contemporary performance and touring shows to festivals, et cetera. Um, previously, I spent over 20 years working in large US uh, not-for-profit producing theaters. Um, so I ha so when you say funding structure, I'm like, okay, well, that's a funding structure, and that's a funding structure, and that's a funding structure. So very quickly, I will just say, the, the not-for-profit institutions um, are reliant on a combination of contributed and earned income. More and more, the earned income is driving the budgets of these organizations, and, they're and they really are reliant on ticket income um, for balancing the budget. Um, government subsidy is symbolic in our country. It's not substantive. 
and the um, subsidized contributions are generally coming from uh, individual donors, largely high net worth individuals whose pr funding priorities and whims vary frequently depending on what is happening. Um, uh, the commercial sector is commercial. I don't think we'll spend a lot of time on that. Um, that's my snapshot. Did I miss anything? It's beautiful. Okay. It's incredible. <laughs> okay. So right now we know we are all in a challenging time, sociologically, politically, financially. But we're all here at the festival. Somehow through this, we would love to hear from each of you what specific challenge you are facing and how you're innovating. And be very specific, do it in the framework of your work, and whether it's presenting, producing, festivals. And I will be very transparent, I will be seeking a Scottish answer. I will be seeking a non-Scottish answer. And so I'd like for us to like share and, and do that. And I, I might call on Shauna, because she's in my eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, such big questions, um, and I feel like I've already been on this treadmill for 10 days now, but I'm Shona, and I'm the Chief Executive at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society, which is the charitable organisation that kind of glues the fringe together, but doesn't programme or curate the work of the fringe. Uh, the Fringe this year, we've got 3,500 shows happening in this city right now. There's going to be 50,000 performances of them. We've got 1,200 street performers. We've got 17 country showcases. It's phenomenal. <laughs> um, and the big challenges, I guess, are the mantra of the Edinburgh Fringe is to give anyone a stage and everyone a seat. It's really easy for us to say. It's a lot harder to deliver. Um, and it's, it's dependent on the whole Fringe community being part of that kind of collective vision. Um, and the Fringe was really founded on that principle of inclusivity and access. Um, it's a platform for creative freedom of expression, so it doesn't matter if you're a student at the start of your game or if you're Judy Dench, who's at the Fringe this year. <laughs> um, it, has, um, it has that whole spectrum and it's a real leveller. The big challenges for us, I think, are how do you keep that kind of sense of inclusivity? Um, on one hand, our levers are registration at the Fringe has been frozen for 16 years now. Um, the average price of a ticket is still around £12. Um, neither our audience or our artists will tolerate an increase in those costs. But on the other side, everything has entirely hiked up. So how do you kind of keep removing barriers to access? Some of the practical things that we've done is in the last few years, we've started to call on some of the incredible alumni who have come through the fringe. So you'll have noticed Phoebe Wallerbridge is our honorary president because Fleabag was such a success story through the fringe. Um, Phoebe gave 50,000 uh, pounds into a pot this year. We matched it through other donors to give out quite simply 52,000 pound bursaries to artists. It sounds like a really small thing to do, but we had 677 applications <laughs> for those 50 bursaries. But the response that we are getting, the email, I have two emails in my inbox this morning from artists who got that 2K bursary, and it made the absolute fundamental difference to whether they could come to this festival or not. So it's kind of, I mean, it seems like a small thing, it seems tiny, but it's kind of massive. Um, other things around um, access and inclusion, we partnered over the last three years with Deaf Action. Um, last year was the first ever Deaf Festival within the Fringe. Um, this year, it is extraordinary. I went to see a show the other evening with Elf Lyons, the comedian, who's been working for the last year with a Deaf artist. Um, the show was speech, it was mime, and it was BSL, but the audience was a total combination of both hearing and uh, the Deaf community. And everybody was just laughing together. <laughs> and it kind of, to me, that was like a model of integration that doesn't mean disabled people have to have something separate over here. Um, it's just exactly how it should be kind of normalised. We've got big challenges, all of us, um, and we talk about this a lot, the International Festival and ourselves, um, about the, the um, urgency of climate action um, and how do we continue to be these amazing international events and the Fringe has 72 countries represented on our stages this year. How do we maintain that internationalism whilst also stop our climate from our, our planet from burning? Um, and again, 
A lot of things we're doing around that. Our team don't really travel anymore if we don't have to. Um, we are carbon neutral ourselves as an organisation now. Uh, because of that, we use digital technology as much as we possibly can. But even that, we're trying to make sure um, is digital really the answer or all those massive servers out in San Francisco or somewhere um, <laughs> actually contributing as much to carbon as, as reduction of print. Um, so we've reduced the print run of the printed program by 50% this year. Um, and uh, We have a really clear plan with, with targets year on year from now until 2030 for what we can do. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things as we've set out this sort of series of targets across all of our big challenges and we've given ourselves a timeline through which to deliver them. I'm happy to circulate that kind of um, uh, our sustainable de development goals after this. But yeah, Thank you, Shona. Th no, thank you. That was just fantastic. Someone else. Yes, please, Emma. Hi, I'm Emma from uh, the International Festival. Uh, I will sort of follow on on the climate um, subject uh, and give you an example of a project that's actually happening right now. Um, we're presenting, as hopefully you've seen and got your ticket for, uh, the Rite of Spring next week, Pina Bausch's choreography with Les Cold de Sap. And if you're familiar with the work, you know that there's uh, 30 performers from across 14 different African nations that are part of this. Um, when they tour, they re-rehearse for two weeks at a time before uh, they present the work. So in order to think about how we can more sustainably present this work, um, which has sort of carbon, but also economic implications, um, usually the company, they all travel to Senegal and re-rehearse there. So we brought them all to the UK first. So they have two weeks of re-rehearsal in Ipswich. So there's 50 flights that are not happening to Senegal because they're traveling straight to the UK. So a kind of a drop in the ocean, but it's something. And then because the dates aligned with the presentation next week and they're two weeks in Ipswich, uh, 13 of them were also able to travel earlier in July. They came up to Edinburgh and we had a week of artistic development practice, which we did in partnership with the British Council and Dance Base. So we had 24 artists, 12 uh, from the visiting company and 12 from here, sharing um, and exchanging um, in an entirely sort of um, democratic space where there were no outcomes uh, required. Um, but artists do what artists do, and they created a 40-minute piece of work to share <laughs> within that week. Um, so actually, instead of what would have been a five-day presentation engagement, there's four weeks for 13 of those company members within the UK that's having economic benefit within Ipswich, but also in Edinburgh, and also giving them sort of an opportunity to be in, in different parts of the UK. So it's, it's not the only solution, but it's how uh, you can just use your, you know, just think slightly differently about what the project needs to actually happen and, and how, how you can affect that. All right, who's next? Please. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom Crit. I'm speaking as if I'm speaking into a microphone. But I, can <laughs> need to, I, I need to use my big voice. Um, I'm Tom Creed. I'm a stage director working in theatre and opera um, based in Ireland, in Dublin. Um, I'm a sometime festival director, but not right now, um, and a board member of Culture Ireland. Um, and we're supporting 11 shows uh, this year at the Fringe, including two shows at the Traverse, um, as well as Lancome at the EIF and uh, events at uh, the Book Festival. Um, and we, on the one hand, um, it sometimes seems in these contexts that like Ireland is some kind of utopia of unicorns where like the, uh, the funding went up during the pandemic. Um, we've introduced a pilot basic income scheme for 2,000 artists. Uh, we're heading into the second year of that. Um, so there's more money for um, the Arts Council have the biggest budget they've ever had. Culture Ireland, which supports Irish culture abroad, has the biggest budget. It's not a lot of money by uh, the standards of other European countries. Um, but I think you know there are um, some of the things, particularly in this context where we're talking about um, international exchange and presentation, um, is that the two... Um, our two main markets are the places, two of the places which are really in crisis, so the UK and North America. Um, and so, uh, in a way, we're having to, uh, you know, they're also uh, English speaking countries. So, those are naturally, they're both diasporic countries and also English speaking countries. So, those are naturally 
the places where Irish artists and Irish productions would gravitate. Um, and while that is still happening, uh, to some extent, um, there's a kind of urgency to find uh, new um, uh, new presenting opportunities and new collaborations. Um, and, uh, you know, to kind of build on the fact that we're, uh, we are now the only English-speaking country in the EU, um, uh, or the own, with English as our first language, I should say. Um, so I think that's a particular challenge. I think other, the other um, particular challenge um, is kind of how to um, uh, how kind of uh, fully commit to a sustainability agenda, particularly around international travel when we're an island. Um, it's you know it's actually I um, had an exchange yesterday on Facebook with a, a, a European person who's working in kind of cultural and sustainability, kind of having a go at me for flying to Edinburgh, um, and kind of going you know how long is the ferry? And I went well it's ten hours uh, with the train and the bus, and if you're doing a short trip, and actually we don't have the luxury of being able to hop on a train between Paris and Berlin or a night train. Um, and so how as you know with with these two particular circumstances one around our two main markets and also around being an island um how do we continue to work internationally and grow internationally and also allow our international colleagues to benefit from the increases in funding both to create work and tour work that's happening uh, in ireland um but while being able to be sustainable and finding new places to do it. So I think that's maybe a snapshot of um, where we are in Ireland right now. Great, thank you. That's it, I'm going home to be a court. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Tom. Uh, I'm Mary Lou Oleski. I am the executive director of the Hopkins Center for the Arts at Dartmouth College. And um, I want to pick up on this uh, story of our diasporic communities. Um, you know, 2020 was the first time that IPC came together, and in 2020, we were feeling the pressures of a crisis. And since then, um, we've lost some of our most uh, prolific international uh, presenters in the United States. You're, you're, you're right, we are part of the crisis. Um, we've lost Under the Radar, we lost BAM uh, New Wave Festival, and um, as a result, have fewer and fewer international artists on our shores. I was very jealous to hear that you have 50 in countries represented in the international festival. I'm, I wonder if we have 50 international countries or countries represented in our presenting community in the U.S. right now. Um, so with, th with that said, um, and we're here at a place where uh, the investment was in the flowering of the human spirit post-World War II, I'd love to hear from our U.S. Um, Consul General on um, what you're seeing in the diplomatic corps, how, what, what good news is there out there or practices that we might be able to collaborate with others on and, and where do we uh, find ways to overcome these barriers and not be an isolationist country? Sure, thanks very much. Um, and hello everyone, uh, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm Jack Hillmeyer, I'm the, the U.S. Consul General here in Edinburgh. I feel like an interlooper into your artistic community here, um, but I'm, uh, I'm very jealous uh, of this, uh, one of my secret uh, secrets that I keep within me as I go around being a diplomat for the past 20 years, that I was an acting major in college at first. So, uh, so I learned how to project my voice a long time ago. I don't need this microphone, but... Uh, no, thanks very much for that, but uh, I, I'm afraid I don't have great news for you, because um, as you say, the topic of this uh, is uh, during turbulent times, and obviously we are living through turbulent times. Um, many of you know about our own country in, in America, and, and living in the United Kingdom, there's the similar, um, I guess you could say, splitting the divergence within our, within our societies, um, and it's reflected in, in, in so many different ways, and I think it's reflected in this as well. Uh, I've been discussing with many people um, that every country is different in how they perceive the different challenges uh, and specifically what the government is in charge of. Um, and in the United States, I think it'd be fair to say that um, we don't consider the government to be the one that is in charge of culture. Um, while other countries do a lot more uh, in investing in those, and, and you mentioned Ireland, and Ireland is one of the great examples, um, especially here since I've been in Edinburgh, that the Irish government is very much involved in making sure that Irish artists are represented very well 
Um, we have a small consular corps here in Edinburgh. There's about 18 of us professional consulates. Um, and I think it'd be fair to say that some are more involved. The Irish consulate's very much involved every year. The French consulate's involved. Um, I know this year the Korean, um, South Koreans, are very much involved. But other countries, uh, and, and as we all know, the United States isn't as much involved. We have done some small grants to the Edinburgh International Festival. We've done grants to others, but we don't have an overarching, um, I guess, general philosophy. It's, it's one that comes more at the local level. So um, for us, and to get into brass tacks here, um, cultural funding within a US embassy is handled at the amb ambassadorial level. So it's basically within an embassy. And um, it can really go, as you mentioned, the whims, um, not only the whims of an individual, but the whims of a policy. So we all know the current administration. The current administration is willing to fund a lot of things and, and has certain perspectives that a past administration or a future administration most likely would not. Um, those of you who are more of an experts on the National Endowment for the Arts than I am, um, but obviously they follow very similar models. Um, but I think um, just being here in Edinburgh, and one of my jobs is to advertise and to promote all of this, uh, we'll be talking about the value of this international exchange. Um, uh, you know, I'm very proud. I tell everybody how the Edinburgh International Festival was founded by a guy that then went to America, Rudolf Bing. So <laughs> we're very proud of that. And I also notice that in the same year, or about the same time, was when um, a very far-sighted senator in America created the Fulbright program uh, for international educational exchange. And that was based on the same concept. Um, and I was just reading some quotes before he came here, some very far-sighted thoughts out of an American politician saying, we cannot be an isolationist. We have to explore the world. We have to be willing to listen to the people we absolutely disagree with. Sometimes we've done that better than others, and I hope through part of these conversations we will continue to do that even better. So thanks very much for the invitation. Thank you, Jack. It's wonderful. Who's next? Are you standing Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Fenella Dorney. I'm here representing the Javad Alipur company. We're based in Manchester. We're a theatre company um, who do quite a lot of political work, but also have work that's very rooted in a non-Eurocentric viewpoint and bringing in lots of international collaborations um, in each of our projects. I think, you know, jumping off from what Emma was saying earlier about that challenge around sustainability, that's something that we're looking at really deeply as a company that um, you know, while trying to diversify its income, international touring and that international relationships are really, really important for us. So thinking really deeply about how we can not just tour just for a week, but actually make those tours last longer so that we're reducing our environmental impact, but also able to maximize those relationships while we're there. So we think really hard about the wraparound activity that we have with shows when we're presenting, how we can um, do lots of workshops. We're going to UMS in November, um, where we'll be doing lots of workshops, we'll be doing lots of talks afterwards. So we're working really closely together with UMS in Michigan about um, how we can really maximize that time when we're there um, and be able to add value to what they need from us as much as you know what we want to commit to them. Um, so yeah, that's something that we're thinking about a lot. Again, in terms of sustainability, we're also working with a sustainability consultant to really try and embed those values in our company. But we're also thinking about how we can share our work um, beyond touring um, in ways that may be more innovative, in ways that um, may go beyond just digital sharing as well. Because as we talked about before, we don't know what the um, footprint of that is right now. So thinking about how can we reach our audiences and reach our international partners in uh, new ways that maybe um, won't be so physical but might be more uh, di in digital space without um, just showing films or something of shows. So yeah. Sorry, Ali. <laughs> The subject of my topic is um, fighting over land grabbing. <laughs> land grabbing. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Linda Crooks, the Traverse Theatre, and I'm proud that we've also got Javad as part of our programme. Brilliant programme, I must say myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, what I, I wanted to reflect was just going back to when um, the pandemic hit. The Travers had a show, um, Mouthpiece, which was on at the Auckland Festival. 
I got a call. I just had just had an operation. I was lying in a darkened room, and I got a frightened call from um, the artist saying, "Get me out of Auckland." Little did we know at that point it was the safest place on the planet. <laughs> I was reflecting on this the other day there, and the Auckland Festival obviously were in crisis because they were having to close down very very quickly. But they covered their commitment to us financially. The moral of this tale is actually about kindness, leaning in to listen, seriously listen, and be kind to one another. Sometimes the Traverse can feel like South Korea. We're sound, surrounded by lots of superpowers. Um, and the important thing is that this is a tiny company. There's only 25 of us who run the company year round. And we've got a world beating brand. We need to work together and we need to collaborate in a meaningful way if we're going to have any chance of getting out of what is an ongoing crisis. Mm -hmm. It's not going to get easier. And again, changing the language in this country, Mike and I are working on a project in Lyceum and with other producing theatres, trying to find different ways to do things. And the biggest problem we're fighting is the resistance to change within the community. And that's bloody ironic as a creative industry that was so uncreative when it comes to evolving. Um, so that's my speech over. I'll now let you speak, Ali. <laughs> Dear, how do you follow Linda? This um, my name's Ali Robertson. I'm representing Akasha Dedra Company. Uh, Akasha Dedra is a British South Asian dancer and choreographer. Um, who presented works in the International Festival last year and also in Imaginate recently. I was going to echo Fenella's point about international being important and link it with your point about an increased reliance upon earned income. The same is true in the UK. And I think it's good why we can only react to the decrease in funding by doing less and using our funding just to sustain our core, which is a deathly trap to fall into, or by doing more. So for us, international is very important. I hear very strongly what you say about trying to extend trips. A problem to which I don't have the answer, but which has kicked in since COVID, is that everyone's programming horizons are all over the place. We recently got programmed three weeks from the confirmation to the playing in Abu Dhabi. Um, and in the same week, uh, I talked to somebody who said, we're full until 2027. Um, now, this is always a factor, and of course, presenters have their own context, and they have to make their own decisions about programming horizons. But since COVID, it's never been as, there's never been as much of a gamut, and I find it increasingly difficult to line up those tours in a meaningful way. Um, that is particularly the case because sadly, air travel doesn't cost that much compared to everything else. What Tom said, I hear there would have been a financial massive cost to you to take the train and the boat and the 10 hour trip. So we find ourselves in the terrible Hobson's choice position of very often going, it's actually gonna be really cheap to go out and do one week and then go out and do another week six months later. I don't have a solution, but I hope that with the networks around the world can recover better so that presenters can work in harmony to present pieces for sustainability and selfishly for earned income reasons. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> I am Michelle Witt. I'm the Executive and Artistic Director of the Meany Center for the Performing Arts at the University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, one of our big challenges has been, or you know, in my thinking, has been how do we continue to renew our artistic programming uh, from many diverse perspectives over time and uh, ensure our relevancy, um, and at the same time continue to empower and support artists. And so, um, you know, any one individual who's doing artistic programming is going to be programming from that perspective. And so, we have launched uh, an artistic pr partner program, and our first partner this last year was Bill T. Jones. 
And next year will be Mark Bamuti Joseph, who's the Director of Social Impact at the Kennedy Center. And one of the great um, outcomes around international touring, which was um, not something that we could have anticipated, and of course this work is uh, you just launch into the unknown whenever you start to partner with um, a new artist, uh, is that we developed an institutional partnership with New York Live Arts. And through that partnership, we were able to bring Robin Orlin, who's a South African choreographer, who introduced, um, for the first time, we brought a work to the US um, and brought an actor to the US, Albert, uh, Cose, um, Albert, Albert Cose, who was able to then win a Bessie Award, um, his first Bessie Award. And so it was something that, uh, by taking a chance, um, trusting artists, to be able to activate programming that institutions would not necessarily choose um, or know to choose on their own. Um, we were able to activate a partnership which was really, really um, useful and will be an ongoing partnership for Mini Center for the Performing Arts. And I know, of course, that's happening here at the Edinburgh Festival as well. And it's, it's really exciting work. And artists are in crisis. And uh, this is an important way that we can not only support artists, but also raise the visibility for work that um, people don't know about by connecting them to names like Nicola Benedetti and, and others um, who do have that visibility. So um, that was a challenge, and I'm really excited about um, this new direction that we've been taking. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Harrison Newman from Yale Schwarzman Center. Um, great to be here. Um, I want to just lift up a couple things that I've heard that I'm connecting with. Thankfully to Cultural Ireland, we are presenting to artists from Ireland um, at the beginning of our season. We're entering our second season only in live performances. Though I've been involved with the organization now for five years, um, we were slow to open due to the pandemic. So it's exciting to finally be doing live performances. But to say that, um, we're starting quite small. So thank, thank you. I'm so glad we have your artists with us. Um, I think that um, one way I've been working is collectively, regionally, with other organizations to try and um, support artists, local artists, mostly uh, presenting and working al alongside uh, sort of my regional partners to, to sort of mitigate, I guess, travel and to mitigate those, you know, those kinds of things. Um, internationally, working with um, a lead artist to curate for us as well over long periods of time. Um, so bringing up artists that might not have been known before, but from the artist's perspective, I think that's another model we're working with as well. Um, so I think I'm, I'm sort of just underlining a lot of things I've heard already uh, from the room, particularly um, as ways of working. And I think you know inter international collaboration, commissioning, co-commissioning will certainly be something we're interested in and in how to sort of build sustainable models. Um, I'm very much interested in helping artists sustain they are in crisis and what does it mean to have um, equitable agreements and equitable con contracts and as we're big and a new organization something that's on my, on my mind a lot is how to build from the ground up yeah e e equitable processes and um, that are embedded in our in our in our way of working and Roy's going to respond to that and then I'll come back to you Ronnie. thank you <laughs> um, just connecting with those couple of comments, um, from a festival's perspective, um, those uh, cultural agencies that are the strongest, so it is Ireland, it's probably Canada and the Quebecese, it's probably the French, will start to have um, a, a very uh, out of proportion, uh, perhaps, representation in programs because they are still well resourced, thankfully, and they are committed, thankfully. But I, but there is, it, I, from a festival's position, it feels that there is an increasing pressure to look to artists from those territories which are very strong in this regard at the expense of other areas of the world who perhaps don't come with that support. So that's just something we, we are witnessing. And then in terms of sustainability, Emma gave a great example, but we're also developing residencies by having two or three of our orchestras being resident for three or four performances in each festival edition. And in fact, in this year, we have three resident theatre companies. So Jekka has brought us Jeff Zobel's wonderful food, which is in the studio uh, just behind us. 
Uh, we have NTS and their uh, production of Throne with Linda at the Traverse. And uh, <laughs> thank you, Linda. Uh, did I thank you, Linda? Thank you. Um, and also, and we must come back to Punch Drunk at the end of this afternoon, but we have uh, Punch Drunk Enrichment's uh, a fantastic lost lending library up at the Churchill Theatre, which plays to a younger audience, which is also here for the duration of the festival. So I think uh, we're embracing those longer runs, but then that does also mean there's perhaps less opportunity for other invitations. So we're always just being mindful of one choice impacting another uh, choice as we go. Thank you, Rory. Ronnie. Yeah, um, hi everyone, uh, Ronnie Pinoy. Uh, I'm Director of Artistic Programming for Arts Emerson in uh, what is known in the US as Boston, Massachusetts. Um, it, it's so funny, I was about to go down a similar path, Roy, to your previous comment, but more broadly what I'll say um, is that all of the changes that are happening, uh, and I'll, you know, I'll speak more to the American context because it's my own, um, it, that because the landscape is shifting so much, what I'm finding uh, in my work at Art Summerson with my colleague David is the sense of who you're accountable to has really um, become more apparent. So not only uh, are we thinking about uh, being accountable to audiences in Boston and to Emerson College and to um, the artists that we work with, but also thinking about for uh, the landscape in the US, if uh, if we don't present a certain international artist, and international work is a huge part of our focus, um, where is that artist and where is that story going to be told? And how is that affecting American isolation uh, isolationism if there's not so many places for those artists to go? So we may have a uh, certain set of priorities, but I'm finding so much more now a sense of responsibility to even if, um, we're not able to move forward on something, having a different kind of relationship to colleagues to say, mm -hmm. I don't think that this is for us, but you really should be taking a, a look at this. Um, and I'll also just add that as a step in the direction of taking some action, um, it, you know, in a, in a certain direction is that we're, we've made a commitment uh, in terms of our uh, international work to present projects that need uh, um, at least one and ideally two additional partners in order for us to move forward. Um, and part of that is uh, about um, carbon footprint, but a lot of that too is about uh, really ensuring the, the kind of partnership of bringing something to, to life and trying on our end to take some of the steps that independent producers and artists have been doing on their own for, for a long time. Thank you. I'm gonna hand this over to Mike Alden and I'm gonna ask him to talk about his challenge since we've discussed this previously. Hi. I'm Michael Alden. I'm an independent theater and film producer. Uh, hailed from LA, spent many decades in New York, and now I'm back in Southern California living in the desert, uh, which I love. Uh, Pre-COVID, I started to notice the decline in, in the United States of just the American voice as far as new plays and new play opportunities to get those pieces out in front of the public. It became more and more expensive, more and more challenging. Uh, more and more dependent on star marquee value than on content. And so I started working on a program that I call Streamline Theater Works and started talking to authors about the idea of digitally capturing your play, optioning it as I would to take it to Broadway, creating a stage experience, but using the digital capture as the calling card. Uh, one of the uh, prerequisites that I wanted to focus on and, and so far have been successful is to have that program work with universities that have uh, Master of Fine Arts degrees so that I could start working with kids in film, theater, television, you know, dramaturgy, you know, directing, acting, and getting them to work together because in the States, the school experiences that I've had is all of those departments are vying for the same donor dollar. So they're really not working together. And if we can create a consortium of students who were raised with cell phones, who were making movies since they were five years old, to creatively bring to life a new play, we can also attract that marquee value name because we're asking them to commit two, three, four weeks of their time, not two, three years. And so I've done one musical thus far. Uh, it was a 24-person musical. It's Christmas. It's called Estella. Uh, it, was, it starred 24 Broadway stars, uh, and the $16 million Broadway budget was $350,000. And the play got picked up by MTI and is available internationally. 
and I'm looking to Linda's point as far as coming up with things that are new. On the challenging side, equity refused to work with me. Uh, they said that my attempt was to cannibalize their membership. Uh, I ended up going to the Screen Actors Guild Ultra Low, and the thing that was most disappointing for me in my communication with equity is that our program is called the Piece of the Pie program. And so our 24 actors will get a check every time the play is done, no matter who does it, and that will happen in perpetuity. The authors gave us the rights uh, forever. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, you know, I, that's a minor, I mean, I, I, it's a minor experience for me, but I, I have been, this is my third festival. I love being here. Uh, Pre-COVID, I have seen three plays that were written by Scottish artists and have come to them in my court of like Americana commercial way saying, this has got to go someplace else. And there seems to be a hesitancy to move the project forward in the world of commercialism. And I'm not sure if I'm not communicating it correctly, but I've sort of had three authors say, yeah, that's gonna be great. And we're like in our fourth year of saying, yeah, it's <laughs> gonna be great, but it's not moving forward. And I don't know what the answer to that is uh, because I'm just at the effect of it. Uh, I don't know where the concern comes from from the artist's point of view. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pamela Walker. I work for Imaginate, who run the Edinburgh International Children's Festival, as well as a variety of stuff across Scotland um, and internationally um, throughout the year. Um, my point isn't falling on from your point, sorry. It was a <laughs> point, just this is a thing that we've been talking about within Imaginate for a very long time, but more so in the last year. Um, one of our uh, main ambitions is to enrich children's lives and um, essentially all of the work that we do we hope will enrich their lives and uh, currently we have uh, noticed not necessarily since COVID but COVID was a huge part of it um, but since the cost of living crisis in Scotland and the UK and also because of the recognition of our government uh, UK and Scotland at times, not necessarily always in Scotland, um, about the value of um, arts and cultures in a school and for children and with children. And um, it's one of the things that we have continuously been looking at over the last couple of months about how, because we have a massive crisis, crisis in Scotland about teachers and schools being allowed to prioritise culture, and I'm sure that's not just a problem in Scotland. And one of the issues that we're foreseeing in the future, which is already happening, is the, the artists that will be in our stage, the people who will work in our theatres, the people who will be part of our productions, the voice that of the people who will make work and uh, the representation on stage will not be um, the general public. They will be uh, quite wealthy, middle class, if not upper class, uh, fa families from that background because they're not getting that support for arts and cultures in school. Um, I'm coming with the challenge. I mean, we are continuously looking at how we um, challenge that within the government, challenge that within uh, the arts and uh, culture in Scotland. But I think that there is a massive, probably international problem in this, and I actually think it would be great to have continual conversations about value, because not just about financial value, but the value of arts and cultures for our children. Um, because obviously we want to continue to have a variety of voices on our stages. And actually, I think that will not continue if the value within school does not come back. So that was one thing. Also, I just wanted to talk about something that happens in Scotland quite often. And actually, we presented a work this year that was actually from Spain. Um, but it's about adaption of work. So we have a very brilliant company in Scotland called Baralan Bali, who adapted a work called um, I think the original work was Tiger, which was for adults. They then uh, changed, I'm trying to remember, that's terrible, I'm trying to remember the uh, version that they did for children. Tiger, I am Tiger, no, no, it's not. Anyway, the, 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 they did a version for ASN children, um, additional special needs children called Playful Tiger. And that now tours as a model where it's three versions. So it's a version for adults, a version for children from a general sort of schooling, and uh, ASN children. And this model seems to be kind of starting to replicate across the world. And I think it's a really, really 
good and uh, clever model. We did it recently at our festival with Animal Religion, which is a company from Catalan. One, we did one other show half of the week and then the second half of the week was a version, an ASN version of that show that was specifically for children with additional needs. And it really worked and we had them the whole 10 days and it kind of worked in our carbon um, area of what we're looking at, but it also worked in our um, bringing work to different children. So, yeah. Um, hello, my name is Liam Rees. I'm uh, an independent artist uh, specialising in international work. Um, I want to pick up off Michael's point there because the work that I've been doing since the pandemic has been largely digitally influenced. Um, as someone on the cusp of being Gen Z slash millennial, I don't know which one it counts as. <laughs> I don't particularly care. Um, but phones and digital media are part of our lives. It's just part of the everyday life but I've noticed it's not in the theatre we make it's almost like we've gone no that doesn't exist because we don't really know how to deal with the fact that that necessitates new stories and new ways of telling stories and the model that you're talking about there it's really interesting and a model that I was using was working with artists in India we would meet on zoom once maybe twice a week and we were able to work over six months because we weren't bound by having to be in a rehearsal room and having to create in a specific time period. So actually, digital work and hybrid work can open up new stories. And it means that, I think there's sometimes a tendency to think that theater is a one specific thing, when actually what this allowed us to do was we had two shows happening simultaneously in two different countries at the same time. And people were saying, this is unlike anything we've done before. This isn't theater, but it is because it's people connecting. It didn't mean that they had to be in the same room. Um, and I think that one of the things that I would encourage you all to think about is all these challenges you have of saying, we need to make work that is climate conscious, we need to make work that engages with young people, we need to make work that insert whichever priority you have. Let the artists know what those parameters are and they will be creative, they will come up with solutions that you have not thought about because that is their entire job, to be creative. And I've seen it coming out, I've seen it in Javad's work, it's incredible, I've seen it in some of the work that is programmed by the Traverse, but the digital world is part of our lives. It's going to be part of the future. It's not part of the future, it's part of the present. Yes. So embrace it. Good, good oh. Hi, uh, my name's Chris, um, and I am representing two people today. On, on the one hand, I'm representing, not me, I'm representing Sumir Bamra of uh, Physical, which is a, an NPO here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Samir Bamra is quite, um, he's quite extraordinary. He well, creates a whole bunch, um, he's looking to prioritize, he's one of a very few number of uh, theater companies in the U United Kingdom whose mission is to promote um, the Asian diaspora and alongside the BFI, uh, runs as the creative producer for the UK Asia Film Festival, which is the largest film festival of its kind promoting um, Asian arts. On top of that, you know, uh, Samir is a multi-hyphenate creative and I, I'm not sure if I should be saying this, but he's just been um, confirmed to uh, have a Western transfer of his uh, his musical Bombay Superstar, which will be, uh, which features uh, a lot of people from the Indian diaspora. His stuff is very important. I'm I'm and so that's on the one hand who I'm representing, but I'm also representing me, and I'm speaking from a different uh, perspective from a lot of people here. So there's a there's a there's a question of um, there's a question of ecology at play here, and I thought what I wanted to add today was. Um, a small view into what I am seeing from my own perspective as well as what I'm seeing um, from other people as an artist. So Samir is my uh, producer for a piece where we're doing a one-person show at the Underbelly Cowgate. Um, I was in the original Western cast of Frozen and I left it uh, last September to go put on this piece. Um, the, the, the trends that you're all speaking about now about the move away from subsidized funding as a viable model to enable our artistry is very much felt by myself. And um, up until a few months ago, uh, we were enabled by, uh, by a charitable donation by a, an extremely high net worth individual 
who unfortunately needed to pull out of funding us um, about four months ago. So our choices were very simple, right? We could either quit, continue, or, or, or pause. We chose to continue, but that meant that we couldn't pay, each other, uh, we couldn't pay anybody properly. And um, I wanted to pick up on the point made by uh, my colleague here, I'm so sorry, I forgot your name. Okay. Pamela, which was very well made, which is this idea that the fringe is such a large thing now, it will continue, it will, it will continue to grow. The thing that happens though, if there aren't other funding things available to us, is that the diversity of the artists available will stop. Um, I know, and I've spoken with uh, all of the, all the artists that I'm speaking with now, um, they are, they're echoing the same thing, which is that if at any other point, because of these rising costs, they would not be able to create art in this way. I've been enabled by a whole bunch of people, especially my team, who haven't been paid properly. I myself haven't been paid properly. We have small funding things like this, um, this Edinburgh Keep It Fringe Fund. But what it, what, it, what it does require is that artists now need to innovate, as my esteemed colleague was speaking about before. And what we've needed to do, and we've put enormous amount of effort into it, is we've started uh, taking bites out of the pies normally reserved by um, funding specialist producers. So now we are learning, we are needing to learn, we're needing to invest in um, how do we approach, how do we approach and, um, uh, and curate the relationships of um, funding specialist producers from starting from zero, without funding, without, without training, without understanding anything, without any formal understanding of the systems whatsoever. How do, we how do we cobble together an understanding of the industry that is large enough? Now, from that, I've needed to learn a few things. The first of which is that, uh, oh, um, Samir's company gained NPO status in the last cycle, which is kind of extraordinary in the United Kingdom, because a vast majority of uh, many, many NPO, uh, NPO organizations lost their status. NPO status means that you get generally a, a, very, a very brief outline funding for three years. Um, in, that, in that context, uh, the UK government chose not to increase their, their funding pool in line with inflation, which is tantamount to a 10 to 11 percent uh, reduction in overall funding across the United Kingdom. On top of that, we have more and more uh, funding being removed from London-based pools, which is where the majority of UK-based artists are. Apologies for regional uh, experts here. Uh, which means that there are more hungry mouths for less money um, in targeted uh, uh, centers for art, which have been sustained for you know, decades upon decades. So what is left? What's left is, a lot of people, myself included, looking at simply quitting. Uh, like tardigrades, like other animals, or like you know, drought-stricken drought, drought -stricken frogs will go underground. And over time, as Pamela mentioned, what will replace us is uh, middle-class people, people who have privilege, people who have the money to fund themselves, people who have the capacity to reach into their pockets and pay 40,000 pounds to run an Ed Fringe run. Um, and then you will lose out on the wonderful experiences and the, the curated art and the, the dedication of decades and decades upon artistry, the investment of time and humanity and heart, which creates good art. So the question really isn't, um, will the Ed Fringe or any other fringe ecology continue? The question is, what shape do you want it to be in um, as it continues to, to grow? Great. Um, I'm David House. I'm the um, Vice President of the Office of the Arts at Emerson College and Executive Director of Arts Emerson. Um, I'm working with my colleague, Ronnie. And um, a couple of, first of all, Chris, thank you for that um, passionate and very um, compelling case around the inequities that exist in the system. It was named earlier when we talk about the haves and the have nots, the companies which, for whom we're grateful with the great resources are actually driving in many ways the shape of our future. And you're speaking very passionately about um, the inequities in the funding systems and who gets funding, right? Which is an ongoing issue even um, no matter where we are. But the, the point I want to raise for, for me, for myself, is around um, our commitment to centering both artists and audiences as creators. And I think for m my understanding is there was a res study that came out, Slover Lynette, Clover Lynette, Slover something, um, about a, a year and a half ago, two years ago, that talked about the fact that audiences were, 70%, 76% of audiences were looking for organizations, presenters who were more socially focused in their, in their work. And they were also hearing a very divergent voice in the present moment around um, audiences um, saying that we've gone too far in that effort. So how we're 
able to both serve the artists and serve the audience at the same time, knowing that we've got these divergent sort of perspectives around what's needed. And so I, I feel like we are hearing m many different things and listening to very little of it <laughs> as we go about our, our practice. And so that's a bit of a challenge um, for me as I think about the work that we're collectively doing, how we're serving all the many stakeholders that um, uh, actually have voice in the work that, that we're doing. Thanks. Um, I'm Mike Griffiths. I'm the uh, executive director at the Royal Lyceum Theatre, the other key producing theatre in Edinburgh. And I suppose there's a couple of things. We've been on quite a long journey um, going from a repertory theatre that produced uh, seven or eight productions of our own, uh, basically for a subscriber audience, uh, moving now to a range of projects that we're basically collaborating with everything. Every show that we do is a collaboration except our Christmas show. And that includes the international work that we're doing as well. And one of the things that's come out of the, the last couple of years and has been a lifesaver prior to uh, the pandemic was a, a piece of legislation that went through the UK government called the Theatre Tax Relief. And the Theatre Tax Relief has basically been the unspoken funder of a lot of projects that have happened in Britain in the last 10 years. And, and effectively, at the moment, it means that about 40% of your creation costs are refunded to you. And that makes an immense difference to us, which led to us this year, um, since the pandemic, doing the largest amount of new work that we've been able to do. And as a result, taking the largest amount of income back from the tax system that we were able to. This, um, this particular level, which is around 50% of 80% of those costs, is, is only going to continue for the next couple of years. But it does mean that in, uh, you know, unlike Ireland, which has a long-term idea of what it wants to do with its um, creative uh, sector, we have a very short window where there'll be opportunities for us to make work with partners and get it out to people very, very quickly, because that starts to change in April 25. I just want to make a comment on uh, something I thought was very interesting, what Liam said, uh, the, just the reference to technology uh, in the arts. Um, I guess as the token non-artist in the room, I sit in a lot of meetings, government meetings, business meetings, and other meetings, and everyone is talking about AI. And I find it interesting. I wonder how that's going to impact your industry. I mean, I'm not saying that there will necessarily be, you know, chat GPT, give me an opera. But that's where it's going with a lot of other things. <laughs> And I don't know what that's going to mean for all of you. I hate to be the scary one in here, but change is going to continue, and it's going to continue to impact you in so many ways. Well, it's already here. We've given it up to anybody into Album Voyager. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, and, and Jack, I think you make a really important point, because in different cultural organizations, people are sitting down talking about how not to be afraid of it. And then where do we go? And then clearly it needs to be a part of this discussion. And, and other discussions, because it isn't going away. And Liam, I really appreciated your comment about, you know, you have to have three generations at a table when you're having a discussion, <laughs> because that's how you get forward thinking, but how do you use it? How do you, you share it? I also think there was a great comment made over here about being able, Chris, being able to help people to learn how to produce. You know, it's not just artists making work, but how does work travel and who makes that happen as well, that that's equally as important. Laura? Hi, Laura Colby. I'm the founder and president of LC Management, which is based in Brooklyn, New York. And um, nearly half of my roster, I represent a global roster with about 20, 22 artists, nearly half of whom are internationally located. Um, five countries, three continents. So I live and die on the international exchange. It means the world to me. Uh, we specialize quite specifically in contemporary theater, dance, and circus, and a lot of outdoor spectacle. Um, the challenge, as someone who is both touring companies out of North America and over the big oceans, as well as bringing companies over the big oceans into North America, um, I was introduced to this magic in August in Edinburgh, thanks to Mr. Mishala, who said, just very pointedly, you must be there. So I showed up. <laughs> I showed up. And um, it's, you know, it's, 
needless to say, the world has been introduced to me and my life changed as an arts worker quite dramatically just from coming here and being on the ground. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm in a moment where I finally am bringing a UK artist into North America. I win. Yeah. <laughs> Only took me five years. So, and this is classic. When I first started coming here, it was in the heyday of the British Council. When I know many of you experienced this, especially the North American presenters in the room, you would go see a show. You would say, yes, I want. They would make, and you would tell them what season, and they would give you a subsidy. It was like magic. So I never got to benefit from that because I was still a, very much a baby in the room and not, so when I finally got there, oh, what, where'd the British Council go? <laughs> all, all gone, practically. I mean, it doesn't exist in the same, with the same robust muscle that it used to have. So the UK company I'm bringing over, which is an award-winning company and blah, 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 doesn't, is coming over with not an ounce of UK money backing it for its debut in North America. That's painful. So there, that's, that's, that's a big reality. And then for the US artists, well, forget it, because <laughs> there's nothing. There's nothing but people like me and Mara and, and Michael who are you know, maybe screaming as loud as we can to say, look, 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 good work is being made. And because we, we got, we're getting no love, no love from nobody. And the US artists, we don't have an export policy. We have very little support. So it's impossible for US artists to compete on this global stage, but we're doing what we can. Um, Somebody pointed to the, the equitable contracting. I think it was you, <laughs> Jennifer, thank you. And I just wanted to say in this room, this room of, of international colleagues that a whole lot of work was done during the pandemic in the US mm -hmm. around equitable contracting. Um, there was an artist-led group called Creating New Futures. APAP uh, put together Building Ethical and Equitable Partnerships, BEEP. And Dance USA put together an equitable contracting resource. So these are all advocating for first payments, things like out-of-pocket expenses guaranteed in the case of force majeure. There's language change. This is a daily challenge for me. I'm fighting with a, a university. Uh, fighting's a big word, but I'm, <laughs> I am conversing with the university about the lack of a first payment, as usual. This is huge, and you know, Colleen, you come from an institution the size of a ship, and you know what it's like. You wanna make a little itty bitty change, and it's gonna take a room full of lawyers and the president of the university to get a $5,000 first payment. I mean, stop it, stop it. So I just wanna, I wanna point to these three documents because they actually all live on my website now and which is lcman.org, it's like the woman's name, E-L-S-I-E man.org, and it's under about, and it says equitable contracting, just in case all y'all nerds out there want to do some great reading. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, thank you. I just want to add a couple of notes to that before we go to Mary Lou, Jekka, and then Mara, is that one of the challenges we all have is to learn how we do differently precisely what you're talking about in being paid for services versus advanced payment is one of them. We worked with um, Enua Ellum and Kate McGrath at Fuel Theater because we loved the Barbershop Chronicles. And we are not agents or touring managers and we put together a national tour for them, including their visas, including everything else. And so partly what we all have to do, particularly presenters I'm, I am looking at, is learn how to do other trades and make that a part of our regular mantra and things we are doing. So thank you again, Laura. Mary Lou and then Jekka. Actually, Colleen, thank you for that because I was gonna pick up on um, all of the capacities that have been articulated in this room and how we individually, when we go home, we think about how to apply those capacities to our own sphere of influence and how much different the world would be if we could continue to have these kinds of dialogues and these kinds of um, opportunities to think and reach across borders, to collaborate in kindness. Thank you, Linda. And, and to not just think about what 
uh, we are as presenters, but to think of ourselves as, as people who facilitate each other. Because there's a lot of disparity also right here in this room. Those, uh, those creators who are here that are self-funded and independent and have to worry about their resources for their artists and themselves versus those of us who are institutionally supported. And sharing that is something that we don't do as well as we should. I have to say I'm very excited about any producing partnerships in the UK for the next three years, hoping you'll think outside of the UK. Um, and also in, within our sector, and this is something that you brought up, Jack, as we're facing new challenges, not just the complete sustainability of what we know, um, not just the underfunded Global South, which is being lifted up by the fringe in um, Voices from the South in a small showcase um, this time, but also uh, those people who are, being, who are being replaced with AI that is the result of the SAG and writers strikes in the US right now, all people who all work in, across all of our sectors. So I, I don't want to sound preachy, but I, I, this is coming from a place that sees nothing but possibility among all of the comments that were made. Look at what we did. And let's add, uh, we see you white American theater uh, to your list, um, you know, Laura. It, we've, we've done a lot. We can do more. So thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jacka Berry. I am an independent producer. Uh, I'm very lucky to be here with Jeff Sobel's Food at the International Festival. Please come and see it. Um, uh, I also have another company called Up Until Now, which focuses on work with uh, the deaf, blind, and disability communities and developing new work, um, both live performance work and digital work. Um, and you know, as, as an independent producer, I've been very lucky to have toured a lot internationally and domestically. And one of the things that I have, I have found sort of in the last coming out of the pandemic is that there is this desire for more transparency. Um, I have never had so many conversations with presenters where they have shared budgets with me um, and showed me what their labor costs are, right, which can be wildly divergent depending on where in the country you are. Um, and it does feel like there is this moment of saying, let's figure it out together. I think for me, one of the things that that extends to is, um, is seeing a willingness of organizations to work together within a community, two different theaters that five years ago would never have, have had a conversation about co-presenting a work are now being willing to have that conversation. And I wish that there was, uh, there was a more formal way. I, I feel like a lot of the times it's like, okay, I had this conversation with this theater and I had a conversation with this theater and they're both interested in the same work. Can we come together and talk about it? Whether that's marketing, presenting costs, equipment. There's so many ways to, to have those collaborative um, presentations. Um, and I think then the other thing that, that I, am, I am seeing and I think is really important is having a longer lead time. That there is, um, you know, the work that I do with up until now, when we go into a community, it is so important that we're going in and being set up for success. And that means that there is probably a year's worth of engagement that needs to happen on the ground with organizations that are working with these, uh, with you know the deaf community, the blind community. Um, and that requires staff resource, right? That, that we can't do it ourselves. But whether it's with food and partnering with farmers markets, you know, with, with organizations that work on food and security. And to <coughs> me, that is about, it's, it is about both doing the work to engage with, with local communities, it is also about growing the audience base. And, and if you can put, if, if we can figure out a way to do that longer term work, then, you know, to Mara's point at the beginning, like that is a way to grow the earned income, right? Because you are then uh, creating an incentive for, as a presenting organization, to continue to program work that is going to engage with those communities. Um, and so it really does feel like there's this, this cycle that's happening. And just, I, I live in New York, and the thing that, that I get scared about is when I see so many New York theaters um, that have traditionally 
developed and programmed really great, innovative, weird work, and now they're looking for the piece that's going to transfer to Broadway. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I feel like that is setting us up in a way that is moving us away from how, we, how are we continuing to engage with populations that are going to grow our audience base in a, in a much broader way than, uh, than what is the piece that's going to uh, get the commercial transfer. Um, I'm connecting a few dots and adding a couple of um, thoughts of my own. I've been thinking a lot based on various comments about audience. Um, David, thank you for that. Liam, I was thinking about your examples and the one thing that I, that I didn't hear in that was audience. Um, and that, so the one thing I just want to name and then I'm actually going to move on from this point is that I'm in it for the liveness and I'm in it not to negate the digital, not to negate the AI, but the thing that makes what the people in this room make different is actually the relationship between performance and audience, however we define what that is. And I just want to make sure that as we move this conversation forward, we are thinking holistically about that relationship. Um, relationship for me is, a, is, a, is almost a manifesto in and of itself. Organizations don't produce work. Buildings don't produce work. It's people that produce work. It's our relationships with each other, our relationships with artists. And so as we move from thinking to doing, the thing I want to say to everyone in this room is that we actually have the ability as individuals, because somebody can go meet with a president and change a policy or whatever, to actually start to forge the path forward. Mm -hmm. That I, we want to sit here and list the, the issues that are wrong and wait for someone to present the solution to us. But in fact, it is our job to come up with the solutions. I'm thinking, Jack, I'm looking at you, like, well, why can't we think about cultural diplomacy in a different way? How can we harness, there have gotta be some individuals somewhere in the State Department network that we can maybe pull together to actually have a real conversation and affect change and not just, not just accept the status quo as how we move forward. So I just wanna put that into the room for thought. And I wanna, before, um, Ryan, before you go, I just also wanna add, I think it's really important that there are no grids and boxes put on art. Art is art. And it doesn't matter where it's made or where it's shown. And I think one of the issues that uh, we in the US have fought with is there's a segregation. Mm -hmm. There's work that's commercial, that's work that's not. Art is art. And there are things we can learn from each other. And sometimes the art goes to that house, or sometimes the art goes to that house. But we're a part of the same village. Mm -hmm. And we have to not circle the wagons and shoot at each other, but really think about how we can grow from each other. Yes. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's a perfect segue for the point that I want to make. So I'm the creative associate at Northern Stage, which is the largest producing theater in the northeast of England. Um, and I suppose just wanted to kind of share I was thinking about Mary Lou's point about your sphere of influence, and I think that as, as myself and my colleagues work to build international partnerships to make work and to bring work to a building that was built at a time of huge, um, healthy government subsidy that allowed beautiful international work from across Europe to come to Newcastle and, and meet an audience, um, we also need to think really carefully about the impact that we have on the place where we work. So prior to this role, my creative practice research kind of sat thinking about place and, and how kind of cultural work and cultural centres relate to placemaking. Um, we have an opportunity here to think about how all of the actions of this kind of business uh, have implications in our community. So uh, I'll share a very small example, which is that our rehearsal spaces are in a community um, in east of Newcastle, council estate called Biker, um, where we've made work there for a long time. We've got a really deep, meaningful, relationship with a very small community of people who are kind of uh, kind of at the core of our organization and coming closer to programming decisions and to institutional decisions. Um, that place is very poorly served by public transport infrastructure and very few people own a private vehicle. So there's very little access to the city center where our asset is supposed to serve those individuals. Um, and every time an actor or the artistic director or myself takes a taxi from our facility to those rehearsal spaces, we weaken the case for an improved public transport infrastructure to serve those individuals. Um, so I think we have to really think deeply about the actions that we take, where we are spending our government subsidy, where we're spending the income that we earn to serve this community, to serve the place where we are, and actually to build the place where we are. 
because that has a direct implication of the cultural lives of those individuals that we're purported to serve. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Michael Mushala. I'm an independent producer, and I want to thank you for all very much for inviting me here today. Um, <clears throat> I, I have more of a question than I have something to say. You know, I think one of the th one of the things that becomes obvious as we listen to all of the points that are being made is that we're all, we're, you know, think, take it outside of the world of the arts. We're we're in a bit of an you know a, a, an industry's ecosystem, and what is what is the role of each of us in that international community uh, as, part of, as part of the supply chain, if you would? You know, what, it, what happens when the uh, programming horizon is changing so dramatically? What happens if, if we're in the middle of a, uh, an, a tour in, in, and somebody drops out? You know, these, these things happen all over the place. I don't, and I just, I just want to put out there that I think a lot of us, I've, I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of people in this room. I think we do collaborate. I think we just have to sometimes look a little further. How integrated is this ecosystem? Mm -hmm. I just want to leave that thought. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Liz Kellertrip. I'm here on behalf of Spoleto Festival USA, which is in Charleston, South Carolina, where I've been the lead producer for about nine months and having just survived my first festival, um, <laughs> barely. Uh, I'm in the throes of frantically programming 24, 25, 26, and, and beyond, as I'm sure many of you are. Um, I'm, I'm so delighted to put uh, a lot of faces to names that I've heard um, in, in this job and previous roles, and I can't tell you how much, uh, so much of this resonates with me. I'm, I'm seeing um, so far in this post, which I'm, I'm bringing a, a variety of experiences to, but it's the first time I've held a role like this. And um, what I'm seeing is, is almost a sense of competitiveness about creating new work, and that's something that we're struggling with internally, is wanting to be at the forefront of creation and producing, while also honoring and giving second, third, fourth lives to really powerful work that's already out there. Um, and one opportunity I see for Charleston, specifically, and the South um, more broadly, uh, is to offer different ways in, which is something I feel really passionately about as, as a concept, just making sure that there are either multidisciplinary ways of entering into a, a concept or a programmatic idea or some kind of discussion or some kind of, um, some kind of reflection that, that offers um, that offers different kinds of pathways in. I, I know that I myself um, bristle at certain topics but also need to hear them, but I need to be welcomed in somehow or I need to be offered a different path in. Um, so, uh, so all of that has resonated with me, so I don't want to repeat anything that's been said, but um, maybe I'll just offer one other thing that I'm noticing in my work so far, which is that um, Spoleto specifically uh, has undergone a huge transition in its staffing. Uh, I'm one of uh, five brand new senior management members, um, and the general director is still quite new. Uh, Charleston itself looks way different than perhaps <laughs> the last time any of you might have been there, um, except for you, Jennifer, maybe. <laughs> but um, it's, it's like half New Yorkers, and um, it's going to be underwater in five years, literally. And um, it, the prices are through the roof for absolutely everything. Um, so it's, it's a bizarre place to be, be trying to create new work. Um, and one thing that I'm thinking a lot about and navigating to some degree is a sense of bristling against stories that might have once resonated locally. Um, Charleston has a really, really um, scary, angry, deep, important history uh, in American history. And uh, some really incredible stories, including the Pulitzer Prize winning Omar, which I had absolutely nothing to do with, but <laughs> hooray, um, have, have talked about those stories. And I am feeling uh, a fatigue about things that are um, uh, stories involving race and gender and, um, and issues that we as artists and art makers feel incredibly strongly about sharing stories of. And um, I, 
I just want to name that and I would welcome <laughs> comments and further conversation with anybody about how you're feeling that in your own communities. But, um, but perhaps more importantly, uh, that, or rather, perhaps then all the more important to find different ways into a story, um, not just so that something is only pertinent or is not just pertinent locally, but rather that there are ways of reflecting on a specific issue that is you know, far more broad reaching than it might seem on the surface. So I welcome your thoughts. Yes, please. Thanks, Liz. Just to say, um, I was at the premiere of Omar, and um, what an incredible um, gift to the artistic community. And you know that piece itself was about spirituality, and it was about um, you know relationships across cultures, as well as it was certainly about slavery and the difficult, difficult history of, of Charleston itself and, and our country. Um, I I did want to just say that I also at that festival connected with our next artistic partner after this next year, which is Rhiannon Giddens, will be Rhiannon Giddens. And um, I, I do think that it, yeah, I understand the fatigue, I guess I hear the fatigue of dealing with some of these issues um, ar around race and equity and gender. Um, and at the same time, I also feel like it is ever more important to be to be presenting this work and, and in a way that Rhiannon Giddens can do it that is also a representation of folk music and it's a representation of uh, the orchestra and the beauty of visual design and, and so many different ways. So I just wanted to, and, and great, great uh, festival. It's an incredible festival if you haven't been to Spoleto. Um, Michael, and then we're going on to Okay, thank you. Mara, thank you very much for your comment. I was kind of remiss. I wasn't, when I was called on, I wasn't. Like, but uh, yes, about the audience. And I have been asked, because my original career was in film, to work on digitally capturing works. And I did not get involved with those companies because they were void of audience. And if there was not the interaction, you're not going to have the same energy from the performance. So the end result of my digital capture company is two, four, six, eight performances in front of a live audience. The goal is to get that work to more audiences without having to spend 68 days on Broadway, you know, or $14 million of other people's money, mm -hmm. but to make sure that that voice is heard as quickly and as economically as possible. That's it. Thank you. Cool. All right. Stunning. All right, we did a lot, and we're about to do about just as much in the next 11 minutes. So <laughs> stick with me, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, so first of all, thank you. When Colleen said at the top, you know, she'd love to hear from all of us, I was like, well, I don't know if we're gonna get through all of us. I think we got through about most of us. Um, so thank you so much for your candor, for jumping in um, and, and, and sharing so bravely. I, I think we've shared a lot of learning and challenges, which is, I think, really rare, actually, to keep a, the balance that you all just did. And to give us a snapshot of that balance, I'm going to pass it now to David House to give us um, uh, just like have some brief reflections of what you've heard in the conversation. Um, again, David House, two hours of sleep. Um, so <laughs> just to say, so my recollection. But anyway, I have to organize things in my head. So first of all, really um, rich, engaging, challenging, complicated conversations we're having here today. Lots of um, thoughts. You know, clearly we haven't solved all the things yet. So there's more in the do tank that we have to do. So hopefully this is the beginning of more conversations to come. But in my head, I've organized this. And you know, I have a little type A. But um, there are four I's. Maybe you'll remember them. Innovation, inclusivity, integration, and um, imagination. So a lot of what we've covered sits in one of those four buckets and I'm adding some C's. So collaboration, I'm adding kindness as a C because it <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and climate. Um, and so just to say on the inclusivity, we started this, this conversation around um, Emma talking about, I think it was Emma who was saying a little bit more about how do we maintain this sense of inclusivity when we're hearing different things from what is needed. You're, um, uh, um, Lori, yes, um, yes, bringing up the fact that audiences are saying that they want one thing but are fatigued in the same conversation. So how we maintain that balance. This notion of inclusivity was also brought up when we talk about equitable practices. Who are the companies, who are the organizations, who are the countries who have the resources and how is that shaping or stifling voices that um, uh, uh, promote inclusivity and diversity. We're also hearing the notion of inequitable practice when it comes to um, who gets the funding, you know, artists versus um, institutions, institutions be they large, they small, who actually survives and what's that, what that's doing for us. We talk a lot about a, um, 
innovation. We talked about the fact of digital, this experimenting very early. We were testing something, oh, it didn't work, we cut it out. Where does that live? It is not uh, the, the future, it is the now, as Liam reminds us, and of how we think about digital programming as something that we integrate, but also being very clear that our unique position is around that relationship that Mar speaks about with audience and um, people. Um, integration, heard a lot about collaboration. This notion of um, the, in order for us to survive, I think it was Michael, I think we have like seven Michaels in this room, right? Um, uh, <laughs> one of the Michaels said something about, nothing, uh, wrong, with uh, that. nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. We love Michaels. Um, the notion that in order for us to continue into the future, we're going to have to be smarter around the way that we collaborate. This notion of um, integration um, and understanding how integrated are we. There is collaboration, but it happens in pockets. And we have to do better at making sure more voices are in the conversation when we're talking about uh, collaboration. And then this notion of imagination, so much of what we're trying to do, there is a resistance. There's a resistance to the in the society, there's a resistance in our audience, there res there's resistance in our own field, right? And so we talked about, um, uh, 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 Lori, no, L Laura, no, Linda, Linda. see, um, two hours. Uh, <laughs> Linda spoke about the, um, uh, the resistance that we're, we're experiencing, um, you, Laura, Yes, here, over here. I've um, also talked about we actually have some tools and we're still resistant to actually embracing those. So how do we um, break out of that resistance? And then, you know, again, both um, um, Mayor Lou and Mar mentioned the notion of uh, we have the answers. We can't wait for folks to come to us. We actually have to, we are the creative industry. We can actually present those um, forward. And then I'm gonna go to my C's, the notion of climate and how we actually are attentive to the climate and the world that we live in, um, knowing the practice that we do. In fact, it feels like, a, I think you mentioned, it's like a drop in the ocean, right? But we have to continue to do this and a lot of ideas are around travel that were brought up and how we might think about that differently. Um, and then um, I'm gonna end with kindness because it just sounds up like a, a great place to live. We are not always the kindest of people. We're not always the kindest of field. There's a lot of competition. There's a very a, much a scarcity mindset. And how do we move beyond scarcity to really abundance? And I think this kind of conversation, this kind of collaborative conversation um, uh, across the water is exactly what we need. We need more relationships. We need those three generations at the table so that we're actually solving these problems um, collectively. So I think that's my summary. And um, I thank you all for giving me this opportunity. Bravo. Bravo. David, that was absolutely, absolutely brilliant. And we, it was amazing. That two it. hours of sleep. We want to see you when you've had eight. So it's just incredible. We want to take this opportunity to thank Roy and to thank Emma and to thank the Edinburgh International Festival for co hosting this very important talk with us. That, that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> And then we want to thank all of you because in this room are very busy people. You are doing yeoman's work. You are mindful of your communities. You are mindful of artists. You are mindful of the greater global good that we can do with our work. So we want to thank you for being here and sharing your time and energy with each of us. And particularly we want to thank HowlRound for always keeping us together and keeping us going. So on behalf of the IPC delegation, thank you. Kevin. All right, um, Roy had a great idea to be part of our closing here. We're gonna do like a minute. We're not gonna pass microphones. We're just gonna say titles of shows that we've seen in the festival or that we know that are playing in the festival that we are recommending to each other. Um, and then we're gonna have this wonderful time in the lobby to say, what was that show? Where is it playing? How do I blah, blah, blah. But just a quick, I'm talking about like a minute, popcorn, speak over each other and then repeat yourself again to be heard, pitches. <laughs> they second that. Belly low to travel. Underbelly. Okay. Food, I don't know where it is. <laughs> uh, uh, in this building. Dark <laughs> noon, uh, peasants. Um, it might not be on your radar, but the exhibition The Tower by Jesse Jones at the Talbot Rice Gallery, just around the corner, is a really remarkable uh, visual art and performance uh, that you should just drop into at any time you have a break in this neighborhood, I think. Um, Song of the Goat Theater at Zoo Theater. Second that. Get it. Wiesenthal. Yeah, Wiesenthal. Oh, very good. <laughs> I feel more Wiesenthal. for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's another fucking pleasure at other, other Valley. 
I've heard about that a great deal. I'm so looking forward to it. It's a motherfucking pleasure, that undervaluing. It was here last year as well, bloody hell, at the trailer. Oh, bloody hell. I heard about that too. And another one at the trailers, After the Act. I saw it last night, it's very good. So I say it again? After the Act. Thank you. Just everything at the trailer. Just go to the Good program. It's a really good program. I'm in, I'm in the Society for New Cuisine at Underbelly Cowgate. Underbelly Cowgate Society. And uh, we have a small invitation from Punch Drunk in Richmond for, um, we've added an extra slot to their schedule tomorrow at 11.40 if there are people that would like to see it. Usually you're not allowed in with a child. Um, but you can, you can go tomorrow. The context is you just have to be aware that you're an adult without a child and imagine the experience with more children in the room. But if you would like a ticket, you can come and see me in the wine bar. Some of us can act like children. Yes, exactly. Right. Right. And we should say that uh, that Punch Drunk show is a collaboration because they originated with Imaginate. Thank you, uh, Pamela. It was a couple of years ago. Or was it pre lockdown? Oh, yeah. Anyway, just so one of our day. collaborations. Can I do a wee shout out as well because there's just so much stuff out there and we can all recommend things but the, the Fringe app this year, yes we have an app, and it works. <laughs> you just shake the phone and it gives you a random selection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just encourage everybody just to take a punt on yeah. something completely random because yeah, you just don't yeah. know well what you're going to discover. Well said. Well said. Jennifer, you're taking that. I just want to add that as I am. No. Oh no. no. Okay, so you overwatching. Anybody over here? Good? Okay. All right. As we close. Take a moment to look around the room and make eye contact with somebody that you did not know when you walked in. <laughs> Take that moment, see their eyes. You may never see them again. <laughs> no. Take a moment and make eye contact with somebody in the room who said something today that you were either really excited by or have a follow-up question for. Take that moment, find them, find those eyes. That's the first person you're talking to at the bar as we disperse there. All right? Thank you all so much for this time. If you're coming to Trojan Women tonight, we'll see you there. We're going to be here for a glass of wine after. Take your clear bag with you. It's your take home. Your clear bag, take it home. Thank you so much. Thank you.